Working for, working for Ralph during the summer, I learned many skills. I learned how to make dendritic cells. I learned sterile technique. I learned electron microscopy. I learned how to um, count silver grains. Um, and I learned how to do uh, proliferation assays, both with tritiated thymidine and with a chromium release assay. So I learned a myriad of skills which would stand me in good stead for the rest of my professional life. But I learned some life skills as well. And Ralph was a tremendously energetic, but also quite an opinionated person. And so when I first came to the lab, I, like Ralph, was commuting through Grand Central Station. And the Rockefeller is at 66th in York, Grand Central is at 42nd in Vanderbilt. And then I said, well, shall I take the bus or shall I take the subway? And he looked at me and said, neither one. He said, you should walk. The bus and the subway each take about 20 minutes. And he said, you can walk in that time and get your exercise in and clear your head. And I had never thought about it, but it was when I began walking for transportation. And I learned that skill from him without really thinking about it. And now it turns out, not only is it a wonderful life skill in terms of saving money and time, but it's probably very good exercise as well. And Ralph walked with such determination and such um, enthusiasm like he did so many other things. But in addition to his enthusiasm for walking, Ralph also used to whistle in the lab. He enjoyed, he enjoyed what he was doing and he had such, took such pleasure in it that he would whistle and sometimes even sing. And he participated with great pleasure in um, our lab bake-offs. So Dr. Cohen, Dr. Zanville Cohen was the head of the lab. And Dr. Cohen, unlike Ralph, Ralph was really in Ralph's life, there was his work and his family, and then there were some people who were sort of like his family, and that was pretty much it. But Dr. Cohen, Dr. Zan Cohen, was in many ways a Renaissance man. He took great pleasure in many things in life, and he took great pleasure in sharing them with the young people in the lab. For instance, he would take people out for ice cream. We would go and walk over to First Avenue and go to uh, haagen which he preferred, or Peppermint Park which Ralph preferred for ice cream. He would bring ice cream to the lab. He insisted that one day in the summer, we all go to Jones Beach. And people, particularly Ralph, grumbled about having to let everybody out of the lab and stop experiments because it was the middle of the week. But there was no excuse. Everybody had to be out of the lab and everybody had to be at the beach. And I remember it with great fondness. People really had fun. We would go to um, Shakespeare in the Park and he would allow people to go you could get two tick each person could get two tickets so you know it was, there was sort of a, a calculation made about who could be spared to go sit for the tickets and we you know enjoyed Shakespeare in the park but one of my most favorite um, memories and I, I think it was the summer of 1979 the entire Museum of Modern Art was turned over to Picasso it was the Picasso exhibit and it was a blockbuster museum blockbuster like no other. The city, I don't believe, had really seen anything quite like it. And Guernica was even brought from Spain and installed at the head of the stairs. It was a very hard ticket to get, and you know people were talking about it, and it was, it was hot in a way that it's hard to understand now because there's so many different things going on, but then things were more focused. And he got tickets for the whole lab to go. I believe, I could be mistaken about this, I believe he, he somehow went through the Rockefeller family and we were permitted to go on a day when the museum was usually closed. But I think it was a Tuesday and we, again, we all had to leave the lab. And this again elicited great grumbling from certain quarters, including Dr. Steinman. But there was no, there was no negotiating, we all went. And it was a life-changing experience. Obviously I'm sitting here all these years later, I still remember it. And we all went together. and you know, went through the entire museum and Picasso's work from beginning to end. So Dr. Cohen did things like that generally, but one of my fondest memories is something that he did for me specifically. Ralph would go, this must have been the second or third or even fourth summer that I worked for Ralph, he would go to the Trudeau with his family for four weeks or maybe even, must have been four weeks, and work up there in their labs and sort of take a vacation. The family would be on vacation and he would be working in the lab only some of the time. It was very lovely. And his longtime assistant and my dear friend Maggie Pack would go with them, leaving us in the lab by ourselves. Well, if I was in the lab, my understanding was I came to work 
and I worked the whole time. I had lunch at, at we had a lunchroom, and I, you know, go to the cafeteria for lunch with everybody, but I wasn't taking any breaks. And the senior scientist in our lab was Dr. De Rene Debose. Dr. Debose was a truly remarkable individual. He was a soil microbiologist who had isolated some of the first antibiotics from the soil. And he had established the lab. Dr. Cohen had come to work with him because Debose worked on um, tuberculosis. And Dr. Cohn was interested in phagocytes, and tuberculosis replicates in the lysosomes of macrophages. And so the focus of the lab had sort of changed from the, the bacteria that replicated in the phagocyte to the cell itself under Dr. Cohn's leadership. But Dr. Cohn and Dr. DuBose were very close. And in fact, Dr. DuBose kept his head of lab office, and Dr. Cohn had the office across the hall. And when Dr. DuBose passed away, Dr. Cohn didn't want to move his office, and Ralph moved into his office. So they had a, a lovely relationship. In his later life, Dr. DuBose became a writer of great note, he, and, a, and an early environmentalist. He was one of the founder of the River Keepers with Pete Seeger, and he wrote many, many books about science for the lay press, the, the lay audience. The one of the, the one he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for a book called So Human and Animal, which really lay some of the foundations for the modern ecological movement. Ralph's favorite of his books was Pasteur, The Freelance of Science, which at the time was the sort of definitive biography of Louis Pasteur. My own favorite is The Professor, The Institute, and DNA, which is the story of Avery McLeod and McCarty's discovery of DNA as the element of heredity rather than protein, which is what everybody had assumed. And it's really an ode to this institution. And if any of you who are watching this haven't read it, I strongly recommend that you do. Um, with that said, Dr. DuBose had an assistant, Carol Moberg. And Carol was his editorial assistant. He was writing at this point. He was not engaged in um, laboratory work anymore. And Carol was finishing her PhD at Columbia in literature. I, I believe it was comparative literature, but I could be mistaken. So she graduated from Columbia. And Dr. DuBose was having a party for her in the conference room. Well, I knew there was a party, but I also didn't feel at liberty to attend the party. I felt that I, Ralph was away, and until somebody told me otherwise, I was working, which fascinates me now that I was so naive. So I'm at the bench, and Dr. Cohn comes in and says, where are you? Come. There's a party. You have to come. And I was like, no, no, Ralph's away. I'm working. He says, don't be ridiculous. Put down what you're doing and come. So I came into the conference room, which is an ordinary lab conference room, one with all our books and journals. And there, on a platform, I don't even know what the platform was made of, was Dr. DuBose in his full academic regalia. Our conference table was covered with a tablecloth and set with this remarkable repast of French delicacies, which now are more common, but at the time were very rare to find in New York. And Carol was in her gown. and. Dr. DuBose was speaking in Latin, and she was kneeling before him, and he was hooding her. He was going through the medieval hooding ceremony of professor to student and conferring her degree on her in our little conference room. And if I hadn't, I would have, if I hadn't come, I would have missed that event completely. And Dr. Cohen was so kind as to realize that I, this you know, little high school student or college student by this point, was missing from the the celebration, he came and got me. So I think that really says everything you need to know about him. In addition to being a brilliant scientist, he really supported Ralph in his observations when others didn't. And I have no doubt that if he had lived, sadly he died of a uh, aortic aneurysm in 1993, he too would have shared in Ralph's Nobel Prize in 2011. Ralph um, kept his name on everything. So it was the, the, the Cohn-Steinman lab. And it remained the Cohen-Steinman lab until Ralph's death. Ralph never removed his name. We still had signs. There was a shopping cart. We pushed things, or, you know, pushed things around from purchasing it. They, they, he kept, and for many years, he kept Dr. Cohen's office empty. So in 2012, I think, Dr. Cohen's granddaughter, Lily Cohen, came back to the university. So she came back as a graduate student. She excelled beyond measure. 
She won the, the Weinberg Award. She won all of the awards that one could win. And she's gone on now to the Biohub, which is the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative funded um, lab that's going to cure cancer and infectious disease and who knows what all. Um, but the remarkable thing about her, not only does she share her grandfather's humanity and share in his brilliance, he passed away when she was four and she grew up on the West Coast. She grew up in Seattle. He was here in New York. So she didn't see him very often. But when you saw her walk down the hall from behind, you would swear from the walk that it was her grandfather walking. And I was just always amazed by that because the, you know, the power of genetics and um, not just in that way, but in many other ways. So, so we had a Dr. Cohn here not too long ago. That's what I wanted to add.